Sentinel Mindset. What's up, everyone? Hope you're having a fantastic day. Uh, question that I have before we start the show here is, uh, for any security guard who is working in Canada, do you have representation? Do you have someone that can speak on behalf of you? If you're not aware, there is an organization, an association called the Security Guard Association of Ontario. Uh, they were formed in 2024. And uh, what I can tell you right now is that there is a need and a purpose, but don't just hear from me. Let's introduce our guest today. To my left, I have Paul Carson, VP of Regal Security, who is the chairman of the SGAO. And again, that is the Security Guard Association of Ontario. And to my right, I have Stephen Somerville, who is the president of Stay Safe, and he is a director of training standards. Gentlemen, welcome to the show. Good morning, Constantine. Good morning, Constantine. Thank you for having us. Good. Amazing. So I guess my very first question, because um, as an agency as, as well, I've been kind of paying close attention to uh, a lot of the conversation that I've been seeing on social media. Mm -hmm. And I know a lot of it stems from an incident that happened back in January of this year at the Pickering Casino. It actually was October 9th of, uh, of this year, October, of last year. Of last year. Okay, October yeah. 9th. So why don't we start about the origin story? Sure. What caused this association to come together? So I have to go back a little bit. Okay. Um, um, I used, I, I watch um, a lot of um, security happenings in Ontario quite, quite um, closely. And um, I was at a casino uh, probably about four years ago uh, where I, I saw a guard that was not in uniform. So I questioned him, and uh, the guard said to me, um, "We don't, uh, we don't fall under the act." And I, I thought to myself, "That's not true." Mm. So I, um, I came out of the casino the next day. I called uh, the register at the time, and uh, I spoke to her about that, and she said, "Yeah, that's 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 the truth." The um, uh, the Alcohol Gaming Commission of Ontario um, and us um, thought it would be better if we if we divided those, and uh, they don't fall under our act. So that was, I, was ups, I wasn't upset by that. I was, I was perplexed by the, 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 the thought, mm -hmm. the rationale behind it. And I said, you know, Lisa, that doesn't make any sense. Um, it's two, two different swim lanes. It's two different standards. It's two different training mechanisms. It's, two, it's, it's, it's just, it's duplicitous. It doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. So we had a conversation about that, and we left it alone. Um, every time I went into a casino, which wasn't often, but you know, every time I went into a casino, I would see that, and I just eh, right. It would just it would be something that would just um, burn you. Yeah, for sure. And um, so then, you know, October 9th rolls around, um, and um, this kid, uh, Michael Ferdinand, um, wakes up. Um, heads into work, um, doing his job as a security guard at the casino, and he gets a call to service. That call to service ends up um, taking his life. And, um, you know, the perpetrator has been identified, still not caught. He is out making rap music, um, enjoying his life. And I reached out um, almost immediately um, to people within the industry, Catherine um, um, McClendon. Sorry, it's a tough uh, yeah. last name. Um, I called her. And who almost, is she? She is, a, she is a registrar for the ministry. Okay. Catherine's been great. I can't say, um, um, you know, bad things about Catherine. She's been very, very supportive during... Uh, during this process, during this this loss, and uh, she wants to change, or she wants to help change the industry. But for Michael, for me, the backstory that started coming out about this was um, they found his bulletproof vest in his um, in his car, in the trunk of his car. Somebody within the organization made a determination that um, they didn't like the look of bulletproof vests. The optics. The mm. optics, okay. right? And they do precious little good sitting on the back of a of a of a chair, mm -hmm. right? They they're they're meant to be worn. And then um, 
as I went through this process of learning more about what Michael was doing and about the event, the scene, all of that, it brought back memories of things that I have done in this industry where I've done um, reviews and such. And I just thought, we haven't learned a goddamn thing. We are still putting people out there in harm's way. Um, we're doing it um, as an industry for, for money. And we're not educating these people. Michael was very well educated. He understood the risks because he had done this before. He had done this kind of work before. And, you know, the fact that his vest was left in the trunk of his car says a lot to me. And then I hear through the grapevine that people are trying to convince the family that, um, you know, based on the location of the uh, the gunshot and, you know, the, the, the closeness of it and the caliber of it and all of that stuff, he likely wouldn't have survived anyway, whether he had a vest on or not. And that was unconscionable to me. Of course. Wow. Of course you are more, you're going to be injured. There's no question about that. But a penetrating wound, a ballistic penetrating wound is um, with a vest on, largely survivable mm -hmm. right you're going to break bones you're going to have you're going to have um, there will be physical trauma yeah you're going there's going to be physical trauma for sure but just the casualness of how people describe this to their family set me off so again i i spoke to Catherine. i had a i had a Coffee with Catherine. No, just just speaking about second. Catherine, she said you, she represents the Soljan's office. Yes, she represents. Okay, so for those listening, uh, the security industry in Canada is governed by a body. Okay, correct. Uh, what is it, the Ministry of Correctionals? No, or? it's now uh, the Ministry of the Solicitor General. They've moved it from the Ministry of Community Safety and Correctional, and yes. Correctional yes. Services. Okay, so, so the Ministry of the Solicitor General. They're responsible for agency licenses. They're responsible for the act that we all have to follow. Um, it sounds like there hasn't. They've been silent in this pro in this situation here. Well, they've largely been silent because um, they don't want. I mean, for this particular event, this is an emotional event. They don't want to. They don't want to be insensitive to families and whatnot, but. There's been opportunities missed here year over year over year. Steve can speak to that as far as the training and 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 whatnot that um, that they could have implemented that may have um, uh, saved Michael um, and a number of other security guards that have been. Uh, that have been killed in this uh, in this industry over the ca course of the last number of years. If I may just <clears throat> inject one comment, going back, uh, my background is initially was policing. I was a staff trainer. I finished, as you know, the Ontario Police College. I <clears throat> have expertise post and previous with um, you know expertise in terms of use of force and training. Mm -hmm. I testified at the Patrick Shand coroner's inquest on behalf of the deputy regional coroner that this was a legislative push to protect the public. There mm -hmm. have been no legislative pushes to protect the guards or the people providing protection, pr pr serving our community. And that, to me, is one of the areas of, it's outrageous. Yeah. So Steve, let me ask you, because you, because your background was policing, yeah. is there a legislation that protects police officers? <laughs> well, there is, as if you take a look at the aspect of, of assault police <laughs> yes. or attempt to murder a police officer, it's a unique distinction on the criminal code. Right. But in terms of legislative, um, that would be essentially, to my knowledge, it. Okay. It's that sense legislation. There's okay. no such thing for a civilian application, i.e. security. But in terms as to legislative protection or measures, which would be somewhat vetted by training right. and equipment and the research associated to each that would create a, a modicum of safety, yes, a paradigm of safety. Most people, guards out there, I believe, live with unconscious incompetence. They don't know what they don't know. They're not trained to be able to assess risk and what reasonable steps would be. Yet they're being putting out there, if I may say, by fodder by some companies with a, perhaps a blind expectation mm -hmm. of safety. And other than litigation, uh, private litigation, perhaps holding an, an employer accountable, 
uh, or that process or the, or the person who causes you harm, uh, there is no other methods or means or applications to provide the level of protection. Mm. And I just think that's important for our viewers here today to understand that distinctive difference. People are being asked to put themselves at risk without any reasonable steps of education or training to provide a reasonable level of safety. So we'll look at this on both sides. We'll look at this from the like the agency's uh, you know responsibility and expectation. We'll mm-hmm. also look at it from like, you know the sole gents office. My question is this: So I've looked a lot of your uh, posts on LinkedIn, mm-hmm. uh, Paul, and you know just to summarize, you, you talk about these events that happen, and then you say there needs to be change, right? Correct. So here's what we're gonna do, and honestly, I, I want to play this out like as an an opportunity here because I think that you're bringing a lot of valid points here. If the soldier said to you guys, "We want to be part and help with this change," what would be some things that you would like to start seeing change? We should start, or shall I? You should. <clears throat> I would think there needs to be a legislative program that needs to be enforced in terms of, uh, for example, for police officers, you have a 16-week training program. For security officers in this province, other than a very generic 40-hour program, there is no other means or methods or requirements to provide realistic training. Realistic training in terms of physicality, de-escalation methods, to recognize steps to be able to control a person and protect yourself and others. So that would be a basic level of a de-escalation or management of resistant behavior program, restraint applications, uh, and also control methods in terms of whether we call it handcuffing or intermediate weapons being provided to them. Guards are being allowed to patrol in dangerous areas of this community without those safeguards, without equipment. Now, will equipment and training automatically make a difference? No, but it creates a different educational process to be able to recognize risk and take appropriate measures. Unlike a police officer, a citizen, i.e. security guard, has the right to refuse the services and to back off and say, no, there's a risk, I cannot. So at that moment, you step back, you would take appropriate measures um, to put yourself in a position of safety, mm-hmm. even removal from the scene, call 911, whichever the case might be. But <clears throat> there is no such standard. Mm-hmm. And even though there are some contracts that are awarded on the presumption of training, I find often clients are not familiar with what that product should look like. Mm. So if you have from a, a, a training product, say, three or four days of training, a lot of companies out there, and I can name the companies, say, well, on this podcast, but a game the companies will short wall that, and then what they'll do is will it down to one day or half mm-hmm. a day. There's no return on this investment of this training mm. program. It's not being paid for. These are not billable hours. For that reason, uh, security guards are being left untrained mm. and left to their own devices. We're, we're hearing, I mean... Is that reasonable? That's absolutely reasonable. To boil it down even uh, more succinctly, Steve, you don't know you're in trouble until 30 seconds into it. And it's the next 60 seconds. What you do in the next 60 seconds determines whether you're walking out of there or you're not. And these guards don't have that acumen. I mean, from my perspective, I've been I've been I've been in this business for 35 years. Um, I, when I started, I started as loss prevention. I had zero training, zero training as it relates to arrests, zero training as it relates to, um, use of force, de-escalation, nothing. When I say nothing, I mean nothing. Right. You're on the job, go find somebody who's stealing stuff. And right. I've been in this business for 46 years now. Right. And I am still shocked that there's been, even at post Patrick Shen inquest, there's been no yeah. changes. One of the aspects of the Shand uh, inquest with the recommendations made to the, at that time, the majority liberal government introduced Bill 159, which came up with it for the first time in this province in 2005, a legislative requirement for some basic level entry level of training. But the areas that was the, the basis of the Shand inquest and the Shand inquiry was this, the use of force components, right. the hands-on. So at some point, the ministry decided because the 40-hour course is how old? It's about maybe it's 10 years old. That, that it, It's longer than that. Yeah, it's okay. older it's 2005. than 2005. So, so somebody came up with that concept. Let's put this 40-hour course together that, like in my opinion, has very limited application to the actual job of what someone requires. Yes. For example, if you go a little bit further out to like Montreal, they apparently have two weeks worth of training. Mm. Here you have these 40 hours. Now, somebody put that together. Why are, why are they not taking um, a lot of these recommendations into account and changing, like how, what, what do you think would be the challenge for them to say, you know what, we're going to incorporate like, you know, verbal de-escalation. We're going to incorporate, you know, use of force training. We're going to incorporate all this as a standard, meaning you cannot get your license until you do this. So the challenge is, um, from my perspective, the sheer, uh, the sheer ask 
we have 133,000 security guards licensed in the province of Ontario. That's a lot of bodies that you got to move to get into uh, into different training cohorts. Yes. Uh, that's a lot of money that uh, is required as well from agencies. And listen, I'm not, uh, you know, I understand the economics of, of this business. Um, you know, I've suggested before, and I will say, uh, say it again, we perhaps need to adopt what uh, Quebec does with the decree and say this is the minimum number for security guards in this role, this role, this role, this role, and this role. And uh, as far as dollars go, and then um, not hope, but make sure, maintain that training is part of that development, is part of that arc, right? I, I would agree. And I back off um, on that one too to say, I'm going to use the word accountability. Um, if you create a curriculum, you're accountable for that curriculum. It's development and it's application. And I believe this government, whichever government it is, hmm. wants to back off from that view and that accountability factor. Secondly, you take a look what's happened in policing. There is no longer a use of force model. It's now called the Public Police Interactions Training Aid. And uh, we train that currently in our security programs. But do you realize as we sit here today, it's going to take another up to five years to get all the current serving police officers up to speed on that one day program. Wow. And that paradigm shift. Yeah, and, and it's, it's a budget driven. I understand. I agree with you. It's budget driven and logistics to take people off the road to be able to apply the training. It's just not conceivable. And that's twenty six thousand um, police officers not in Ontario. Not one hundred thirty three. Not one hundred thirty three thousand people. Okay. So, so with that said, if the soul gen is making decisions, right? Who are they using as advisors to make the decisions? For example, like right now, I know there was a posting about. Uh, you know, look, I, the, the gentleman who's a deputy register for right now, the, the, the soldier, is, his name is Steve Patterson. Okay. Yes. And, and um, you know, he, in a conversation that I had with me, you know, said, look, you know, we have these quarterly meetings that where we like to get input coming in from different agencies. Mm. Um, but, you know, truly it's the people on the ground floor that are going to be able to give experiences to kind of make something change, right? Look, just now, the... The ministry decided to change the process now for background checks. Correct. Right? Just suddenly do that. And now the responsibility now comes onto the individual. Yes. Right? Well, if it was done without any sort of like, it was just done, can't they just say, you know what? This training piece needs to really get changed. So we're going to do this grandfather program where in the next two years, we expect all guards on their renewal to go and get this and this done. Because then someone can argue, well, that does not have to work. The agency doesn't have to absorb that right. the initial cost. But the other side of the, the coin is now the cost to the actual guard. And the guard can say, no way, I'm only making minimum wage, right? right? And why am I even going to bother doing this? It is a cycle that is so hard to For break. Sure. So going back to my original question here is, how do we get more involvement, like what you guys are saying right now, so the soldier can say, look, we need to hear from you so we can make these decisions. So the SGAO um, uh, approached the ministry uh, with the idea of uh, becoming more of a voice within within the industry, or within the ministry, sorry, and um, they accepted our our um, uh, idea. They've invited us to the discussion tables. We're very happy about that. Good. As I've said, I I, I think that uh, Catherine is doing all she can. Um, uh, the the other side of it is. Who are they listening to, right? So you get people that are, their acumen is less than what I would say. Um, people being permitted yes. or invited to provide an opinion, do they have the requisite skills or background to make it a valid opinion? Yes. Right. I'm going to reference what's required in the judicial system, the Mohan decision, to be able to provide expert testimony. And you have to prove to a, a judicial, a, the trier of fact, the justice that you have the ability to speak to either a court and or a jury. And it is a, it's a litmus test you need to go through. Mm -hmm. I find most people who provide the loudest opinion know the least about the topic. And I have, for the last four to four and a half decades, have found that out appearing more and more frequently. Because you have a former career in policing doesn't mean you are a subject matter expert or have the requisite skills to opine on the issues that you're, you're addressing. Mm -hmm. You need a person who is proven in a nonpartisan capacity um, 
being able to articulate specifically areas that makes a difference in a person's training and be able to assess an individual whether they meet that requisite ability. Um, that is probably a more safe voice to adhere to within ministry circle or any government process. Yes. I don't know anyone that's currently meets that criteria. Yes, mm -hmm. I, I, and I agree. I we I always ask, what's your certification? I'm I, like I was certified. I I did use of force a long, long time ago under a uh, a system Minadnock. Um, but uh, I mean, it was a hundred years ago. It feels like. <laughs> <laughs> um, and but I will not uh, provide an expert opinion in relation to use of force. Um, do I know probably more than most of the people that are providing those opinions? Sure, I do. Um, am I smarter than any of them? I no, I'm not smarter than anybody. But the the fact that they want to offer their opinions so readily, and that people within decision making verticals are actually taking notes and you know trying to make sense of some things that are nonsensical and i can i can give you a, an example i was at i was at, within a meeting um and i can't tell you what meeting but i was in a meeting and somebody was uh telling us about how um uh, distance learning is the way to go with uh, security guard training well, distance distance learning okay. meanings meaning virtual over, training yeah virtual yeah. training right well, we had just spent 15, 20 minutes talking about how it doesn't work. <laughs> right. So, you know, how is it that somebody comes in because they have an agenda, they they want that distance learning, that, you know, all of a sudden it's... So, but what I'm saying is, is as valid as what you're saying. And how do you know that? Like, give me some data. Give me some empirical data that that's, that that's the case. And they can't provide it. Um, the SGAO, we did the exact same thing with, um, with injuries. I mean, we were tired of not understanding really what, what the issues were or what the injuries were that uh, security guards were facing. And the causation behind it. And the them. causation behind it. And so we, we did what any good newspaper reporter would do we filed an foi and we did it with the ministry of labor and we did it with the uh, wsib, WSIB. Mm -hmm. and we have we have numbers now that are not pretty <laughs> by any stretch of the imagination and it's valid numbers and, not rhetoric no it's 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 not anecdotal it's empirical data right this is what's gone on we know that um patient watch guards are far more uh, uh, apt to be assaulted in place. And every hospital, every hospital has um, use of force um, training. Is that use of force training adequate? You got to start asking those questions, right? And it, it goes back to it's 30 seconds. You don't know what kind of trouble you are in. For you thirty know, seconds, you, don't know. you right. don't know what you don't know, right. and it's the sixty seconds that you do that you take to analyze, to either engage, uh, back off, whatever that's going to save your life, and it's going to save the life of people around you. the The ministry talks about public safety all the time. We, when we went through the COVID uh, issue, um, and the ministry shut down. They made us. They made the security guard a um, an essential service, and then they shut the ministry down. Sort of like you know, you know, you need gas to get to work, but the refineries are closed. Yes, it made no sense. Right. So we went to them um, as a company, the ministry, and said, "Listen, you know, could we do something like an apprentice program, where we put together people that have to deal with." Um, Supervisors, they're not. They're going to be in a very low risk environment. They will not deal, not deal with use of force issues whatsoever. And the ministry wrote us back, uh, you know, a couple of weeks later, saying that one of the one of the things that they wanted to see um, from guards is that um, they all have first aid CPR. They consider that a public safety issue. Well, when is it a public safety issue for security guards? Getting stabbed 
kicked, punched, shot, crushed. You know, when is it, when is it for us? When does the ministry take that look and say, this kind of behavior has to stop? Or from a legislative perspective, and Steve touched upon it, that we enact criminal code uh, violations for security guards in uniform. Mm -hmm. Very specific. And they have them in the United States. Um, uh, misdemeanor or felony. It depends yeah, on right. what you're doing. And the caveat uh, being, of course, whilst acting in a lawful capacity. Correct. You're covered. You're covered. So I think a big part of maybe this is that maybe people are not aware that there's things happening daily to security. How Since you guys formed the SGAO, uh, how many people have reached out to you guys and said, look, I'm this individual, this has happened to me? Like, uh, So I've uh, I've done uh, uh, posts on LinkedIn for, for this, and one of the things that I had done was I wanted to take a straw poll of uh, how many people in the security guard business have been assaulted, and I asked them to put an A, uh, just an A. They had, I don't want them to... You know, give me any detail, just, you know, whether you've been assaulted or not. And um, there was, um, I, I, I'm um, always getting about 6,000 views on these types of things. But the the um, uh, comments and whatnot were astronomical. And um, people reaching out to me individually and saying, you know, I got, I can't even tell you how many times I've been assaulted. I mean, myself, I can't tell you how many times I've been assaulted. I've been stabbed. I was stabbed in the arm in Oakville, right? Like, uh, not Mississauga, but Oakville. Mis not yeah, Mississauga, yeah. but Oakville. I mean, <laughs> it, what a distinction, eh? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, you know, it's, um, it's things that these guys face each and every day. Assaults are vastly, vastly underreported. Right. Security guards seem to feel, because... You know, law enforcement agency, the security guards look up to law enforcement personnel. And, you know, law enforcement personnel often provide them with their opinions as to what's going to happen with this charge or that charge or whatnot. And it 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 circumvents them laying charges because they go, oh, nothing will happen. Nothing will happen. And I think we as a as a as a corporate entity have to, and everybody, every security corporation has to adopt a 100% policy as it relates to charges for people that lay their hands on security guards, period. Mm -hmm. And there needs to be a push from the Crown's office to support that initiative. Yeah. Well, I, it, it will do one of two things. It will load the courts up so much and really bring a vision or a view to this problem, or um, it'll upset people within the law enforcement community because they feel like, well, this is just a waste of time. I'm doing this, that, and the other thing. But at some, at some level, it's making an impact. And right now we're not doing that. So if the soldier is kind of just, let's just call them observing, not making any action observing, the next, the next potential move could be the putting the onus on the actual agency, right? The, and basically what my onus is that ensuring that their guards are having the proper adequate training to do the job. Now, I'll just throw this out there. I, I feel that I know the answer, but I want to throw it out to you guys. Do you feel that every agency in Ontario uh, is providing proper training no. for their guards? No. Steve? Because no. so, I know Steve sees a lot too as well. So if we can both, if we can all agree on that. We uh, can agree on that. I just want to, set the standard here. I'm saying this in a nonpartisan opinion. I'm right. very mindful of the issues of affordability, costing. Um, I understand there's a lot of security firms in this province that are struggling right. to make ends meet. And it, those billable hours are killing us. They're probably from one contract away from going into receivership to provide training for a, a process that's not returned with billable hours or a process, no funding. Mm -hmm. uh, it's an affordability issue. So, so I'll give an example. Is that, you, is that no, no, that, that, that's correct. Agree. So you buy the affordability. We actually even talked offline a little bit about an R, the RFP process and how it's looked at. So this, this is my two cents on this for coming from an aging side, side of things. I typically don't bid on RFPs or I, I'm very used to saying no to clients. And the reason why is like, 
you know, we want, we want to use you guys, but we start breaking down the numbers. I'm like, well, where's the margins for training? Right. right. And, and if, and for us, if we don't make those, mar if we don't have those margins, we say, unfortunately, we're moving on. In our line of work that we've done, uh, our guards are assaulted regularly or attempted assaults, right? We have body cams with our, a lot of our team members, but these things happen. The thing is that they also have a lot of training to ensure that the, the assaults are, uh, are not impactful or as like, avoided as much as possible. But mm -hmm. the reality is, is that it happens. My whole take on this is that, uh, you know, if an agency has a guard, and the guard doesn't have training, and the agency is aware of this, and then something happens to the guard, the responsibility will fall naturally to the employer, right? But then someone could argue and say, well, this is the parameter that we have, the parameters that this is what we have to work with. I wanted to kind of throw it out there to your guys' perspective on this. Yeah, so so I've done a lot of research in relation to, you know, how, do, how, how we turn people's heads around. And the problem that we have is if guards are injured at work, um, we have we have a, a, the WSIB. Right. They take them into their into their fold, the WSIB for the guard. They um, provide them with, um, you know, their pay and, and whatnot, which is, it's great service. But um, at the end of the day, if, if something is, um, a permanent issue, a PTSD issue, whatever um, that is, the WSIB then uh, will negotiate with the guard uh, um, a settlement, and then pay that settlement out, and then that's it. That's mm -hmm. that's that's the end of that journey. the 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 um, the business is really the only thing that they have to do is pay the premium, mm -hmm. right? There's no. There, there's no enforcement side of it, penalty side. You know, when you get pulled over and you you, you ask a police officer, is this going to be an educational um, um, process? a process or is it going to be an enforcement process, right? They, they know exactly what you mean, right? Um, and in security, in the security guard uh, services, when you get into an issue of a guard being injured and then the WSIB or the Ministry of Labor stepping in or whatnot – that takes it into another swim lane. And a lot of companies fear that that process, but when they get through it, they think, oh, that wasn't so bad. Mm -hmm. And then they're educated for the next time. Mm -hmm. It has to be an education, a, you know, a hybrid, an education enforcement type of thing where security companies go, we don't want to be part of this again, right? So there's a lot of different things. There's a lot of different elements that we can do. Hopefully, um, when we sit down and talk with the, the ministry and um, they uh, listen to what our ideas are, um, they, they will agree and maybe push that uh, peanut up the hill a little bit. Right. But my sense is, is that there's a lot of big ministries all over the place, and this poor little ministry... <laughs> called you know security guards mm -hmm. is is not getting the uh, attention that it deserves we have the same voice as the spotted owl society in dwight ontario i mean mm -hmm. it's ridiculous but we have 133,000 security guards so what do we need to do we need to form we need to organize we need to make sure that the the, the best foot that we can put forward for these security guards is done each and every time. And that's what the SGAO is essentially. Well, it's a voice and it's a voice that, that I think needs to be heard because the thing is with police, they have a union, a yes. very strong union. Yes. And I'm going to just say this, our organization is not unionized. Yeah. And, uh, but what I can tell you is I, I used to be unionized working with the city. Um, and what I've done a little bit of research for the, the security unions, it's a joke. It's a joke. I'm saying unions are supposed to fight for wages. They're supposed to fight for training. They're supposed to, they go through all this process. The reality is, is they're not doing any of that, but they're very well taking people's hourly wages for memberships. Well, they, they, yeah. they, they do do that. They do do that. Um, they, I mean, listen, I believe that everybody has a right to repre be represented. Right. Whether it be by a union or by an association or by whatever. Right. They have that right. If they do it well, yes, then there is a there's a value add right to that representation. If they don't do it well, well then, 
you get nothing. Right. Right. I think that um, from a union perspective, and I know I, I know the unions are not happy about the formation of the SGAO. They've made it abundantly clear to uh, us, myself specifically. Mm-hmm. Um, but we're not here to re- be, become a, a union. But, but why are they unhappy? You're fighting for the cause. Well, I, to be honest, I think they look at us as um, competition, and they haven't done. They haven't. They haven't um, uh, created a uh, a form for 133,000 security guards. Well. Mm-hmm. Um, and, um, they look at it like, well, the association is just a pseudo union, which couldn't be further from the truth. Mm-hmm. We're, we're, we're here from an education, from a training, from a development, from all those standards, right? We, we, we don't care about the, 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 the sundry items that the unions, uh, deal with. We want to be a voice. Mm-hmm. We need to be a voice, the voice, uh, for the security guard, because, you know, the the owners magically created an association a while back, and that was an owner's association. That that uh, that um, forwarded or or um, uh, provided owners with a voice within the industry. My my question was, why did the owners need a voice? Right, because they saw where the union or where, where the ministry was going at first. It it you know frightened them obviously because there's there's money involved in this kind of stuff and they are you're quite right when they say we're going to download that responsibility to you mm-hmm. the ministry says mm-hmm. but why couldn't it be a you know a harmonious relationship where the 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 uh, business entities the industry the guarding the guards and um, the ministry all sit at the same table and say, you know, what's your jam today? What's 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 the problem? Right. And understanding that we've always lacked a, an ability to toolkit up. We're always five miles behind the trends that are going on today, mm-hmm. right? There was. Um, I just want to try to validate the actual time frame. Perhaps nine or ten years ago. This is when security was still under, at the time, the Ministry of Community Safety and Correctional Services. And at that time, there was a push or perhaps a discussion from the ministry level about having the Ontario Police College do a review on security-based curriculum and the development of security-based curriculum. And then what came back was the cost associated to that, what it would be, and to be able to take a <coughs> relevant trainer with a relevant background, time to do an, um, an assessment process, a review, an audit, if you will, or a postmortem. And to be able to develop a curriculum that would be put forward. Uh, the reason it was dismissed and canceled at that end is because of availability of appropriate resource. And secondly, the costing for it, who would pay? And they, they, I believe the number was around $700,000 at the time mm. to say this is the likely prediction of how much it would cost to come and, up with a curriculum. And I think it goes even, it goes deeper than that, Steve. And I think that what they, what they do not want to do, the ministry, they've, they've got this, uh, they've got this uh, tiger by the tail. So we're we're a protection industry. We are not part of the government. That's right. They never want us to be part of the government because then what happens? We become little pseudo police officers. And that is bad for them. Mm-hmm. Bad for the courts, bad for the, because then we then there's standards that need to start being driven, right? And then they're responsible for those standards. Um, and then we become we become um, not a private entity anymore. We become, uh, you know, a uh, getting to the threshold of a special constable. Yeah, we really right. are right, and that's what they want to avoid. Yes, and I understand that. I completely understand that. But they just need to be transparent about these things, right? They, they, they want to liken it to this dark art where they're 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 talking about something, but they're not really talking about it. Right. And it's it's frustrating. It's because. You know, in my mind, Michael would not be deceased if we had an open on conversation about this starting in 2005 and did what we did or what what was um, purported to being done, which was the classification of guards and, right. you know, where they where they were in the training reg- uh, regime. I mean, which makes perfect sense. 
if I have a security guard that's working a construction site, um, does he need use of force? We all sit back and pontificate, right? Um, condominiums. Some, some condominiums, I would say absolutely they need use of force because of the type of condominium they're in, right? There, there is an entity now that has no legislative authority that does this sort of audit. It's the Public Services Health and Safety Association. Right. And there was, they're recognized as the educational wing from the Interior Ministry of Labor. They have created a platform. They have created syllabus, especially in the health care for security mm -hmm. provision. But it's got no muscle, no enforceability. Well, it, it's put out there as being an excellent product. And it identifies the mandatory training annually or a one-time gig. But there's no enforcement at all. Well, this was this was surprising to me when I, when we received the information about the FOI from the Ministry of Labor, um, they really um, they were really concentrating on patient watch, mm -hmm. so much to the point, uh, so much to that point, that they developed a training document for security companies. Where is it? Mm. For you, for patient watch guards, right? How, why don't we readily know about this document, right? It's buried. Uh, it's I, I yeah. Unless my, you know how to find it and or locate it. Yeah, mm -hmm. in my mind, it's buried. And why mm -hmm. is it buried? Because it was sub. I mean, first of all, they don't want to launch it out to the to the rest of the um, to the rest of the organization and have the ministry get upset with the fact that they've created this document outside of their lines of vision, mm -hmm. right? Which you know, it's a bit of a bun fight, but in doing so, they are putting people in harm's way. This 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 lack of congruent effort. And that's all we're here to do. That's all we're we want to make it as simple, as as uh, fulsome, as um um The, the word um, caring mm -hmm. comes into my mind. A care component. Right. And that makes sense to everybody. Yes. And that uh, security guards can wrap their heads around, right? Maybe we're, we need to look at how we train. Maybe that needs to change. Maybe we need to have, um, I don't know, and I'm throwing this out here. I'm spitballing at this point, Steve, but maybe they, they should have schools that are accredited for that, just that thing. We all know we all know that the Ministry of Colleges and Universities loves this kind of stuff, but they have to start somewhere. And, and a lot of the times it takes them years to tool up. Right. Where you have people like Steve and other trainers out there that are, you know, walking. Yeah. They can do this. Absolutely. Right. But even if you look, not being political, it, not trying to be political is the issues is what's happened right now with, with um, community colleges. Yeah. Um, how there's been a push with international students, which basically, other than your college universities, all international students have been shut off now from secondary educational facilities. They're not being validated. Mm. And there's going to be a lot of companies out there who teach. And you teach skills and whatnot that have been accredited in the past. That's been removed in the last 30 days. Wow. And, and, see, and that's the thing. It just seems there's a lot of broken systems in place. See, my, my thing is this. Uh, like I know that the the whole soul gen battle is going to be a lengthy battle. It's it not is. Gonna, it's not going to. It's going to take its time. But until that happens, any agency listening, uh, you are part of the solution. Yes. Right. And, and to me, uh, the way I look at this is that you know, Paul, you know, you represent Regal. I represent Sentinel. See, you represent so much entities that you uh, that you basically provide your training through. Uh, the reality is, is that. If everyone took this approach and said, let's work together and come up with a system, uh, great. However, there's going to be giants in the industry. That right? won't do that. That will not, will do, not that. do that. They could care less. The reality is that <laughs> it's almost like they own the market. They can have persuasion. And I think anyone would be silly not to think that there is political persuasion on the top. It does happen. But the reality is, is that it's, 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 it's a fight that will literally take uh, years to kind of do it. But if oh. we all did our part... I, I'm example for on our half I, I, on behalf of Sentinel, what my commitment to the industry is, and I'm publicly saying this, is that every single guard that works for our company uh, beyond the 40 hours gets advanced training, and that training happens to be with Stay Safe, okay, which we are very big fans of. However, if every company 
was to say, we will guarantee that every one of our individuals are going to get not just training, it's going to get yearly training. That's a, that's a, a progression. It moving in, And not everyone has to buy into that. By default, I would see over time, people would be like, well, this is the reason why you want to come up with a trained guard opposed to a non-trained guard. How many more deaths, as you like to say, how many more people will be killed? How many more people will be injured? Uh, at what will point? Be changed. How, exactly. What, what needs to change on that? And so I think there's a, there is an onus on the agency to be part of that change, right? And for any employee in a Hope I'm okay saying this, but for any employee, for any agency that feels that their agency is not giving them all this, and start looking for ones that do. You know what right. I mean? That can give you that. Because to me, like, why would I, uh, you know, look at myself saying if I'm making seventeen dollars an hour, and now I'm making that because the government's pushing the minimum wage up, not because right. my employer is being kind. That's right. Then I should have some level degree in training so I can succeed on the job. Thoughts, guys? I agree. I mean, yeah. I I think that. Um the the issue of training and people the clients not um, paying for it I would say that it's a must and if we all continue I, and I'm not th- I'm not condoning um, uh, putting um, RFPs together that are contrived right. uh, by any stretch of the imagination but I'm suggesting that if we all said, this is what we're going to charge for training. Yes. And everybody lived by that. Right. And said, that's it. We don't care. And we're going to review this annually to see what the trends are, what, you know, what's going on in this, uh, in this industry. And if we need to up it, then we up it and everybody right. ups it. Or pay additional focus or, on a particular correct. problem. Yeah, correct. Yeah. Is there data that exists of companies that have like injured employees, for example, is it just a widespread number? Because I'm very curious to find out how many of those injured employees receive training. So there is, there's data as it relates to individual security guards. I can't tell you what uh, their training level was. I don't think that anybody sort of looks at that. Um, you know, the ministry, um, you know, Catherine's ministry has done a lot of work with the with uh, different ministries trying to get information. Um, it hasn't been forthcoming, and we don't know why that is. I mean, privacy and and whatnot, obviously. But um, you know, I hope um, and hope. I I will say this, and you can edit this out. Sits between shit and syphilis in my dictionary. <laughs> <laughs> maybe you should leave it in. Yeah, right, maybe right, you yeah. should leave it in. But, yeah. you know, if you hope that something's going to happen, um, you've already capitulated that it's not because right. you're already in the hope mode, right? I'm currently involved. Uh, by the way, I just want to say one, uh, two things, if I may. Um, I consider you both colleagues. I consider you both friends. But I'm sitting here today in a nonpartisan position. I do training through my corporation with certainly Sentinel and Regal. Yep. But having said that... Um, I'm not here for that reason. I'm not being compensated, nor are you being compensated. We don't get a discount, Steve. We get I nothing. have nothing. I haven't seen a discount <laughs> from right. you. That's correct. <laughs> yes. And and you know you've never bought me a coffee. That's right. right. Yeah. To say, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Bingo. Yeah. But point being is, uh, I've known Carson for a long time, and we're not in any business relationship together. But ethically, morally, I uh, support this guy. So we'll have critics. We'll have um, skeptics sure. in what we do. For those that know me, they know how I stand. They know how I say controversial things in a courtroom. Uh, I've lost friends for what I've said, which is the truth under oath. I'll lie to you, sharing, again, a cinnabar Mm -hmm. face-to-face, but when I'm telling you, I'm telling you the truth I am. I would stand beside either one of you at any level of scrutiny or controversy to say, yeah, I agree agree with this individual, and I'm going to associate with you. You are who you associate with. You are. And you can either live or die by that sword. And... The message that Carson initially approached me about the SGO, I became so committed to say, I'm in. I want nothing for it. I want no advantage. I want no advertising. I'm not looking for anything. You can go with any trainer or no yep. training at all. But I agree with the message you're making. That's why I'm here today. And that's important. And by the way, for those listening, uh, the association is not just Stephen Paul. No. Can you guys no. see who uh, who the other individuals are as well? Yeah. So Chris Fernandez, uh, uh, ex-deputy chief of York, I believe. Durham. Uh, Durham, sorry. Yes, um, he uh, he's the the chair. Uh, sorry, the vice chair. Then we have uh, Matt Tremblay. He is an owner operator out of um, St. Catharines. Um, he was um, he was um, nominated uh, top uh, top ten under forty. 
uh, in the security industry in 2005, I believe. Security magazine. Yes, yes. Um, uh, AJ uh, Karuna. Uh, AJ is a um, he's a private investigator, but he's also a student looking to get his PhD in uh, in uh, in security sciences. So um, and uh, then Murray uh, Murray Anderson he's and Murray is. Yeah, and Murray Anderson's out of uh, no, he's not out of Ottawa. He, he's out of uh, um, uh, Vaughan, I think. I said correct. Yeah, yeah. So, um, and uh, he's a vice president for RBG. Okay. We're all committed to this. We all understand what the ramifications of what we're trying to do are. I mean, I I work in an industry that is pennies. Uh, focused, profit driven, profit driven. Mm -hmm. I, I I get that, but at some point in time, you got to take a stand. You got to say enough is enough. I was in that position, you know. I've been shot at in anger. I have been stabbed. I've been kicked. I've been punched. I've been spit on. You got to be able to stand up for the people that come after you right. and say enough is enough because they don't know. Mm. They don't know. So let me ask you this. I'm an agency and I agree with the messaging and I love the association. If any agency is listening right now and yes. this is triggering some heartstrings or not thinking, you know, we got to relook at this. Uh, what would you like to see agencies do with the association? So I would like to see them join the association. There's an affiliate member association um, um, program. They will be uh, the associate, the industry themselves, the industry companies won't be voting members. Um, they will be, but the security guards will be voting members. So if you have people in the in the security guard company that you want as uh, voting members to sort of help help you know challenge or move uh, an agenda, that's fantastic. I'd like to see that happen. That hasn't happened yet. We suffered. Um, probably about four weeks ago now, an attack on our website. Okay. Um, for uh, when we started uh, commoditizing the website. Now we can all pontificate as to who those people were and what their agendas were. Um, obviously nefarious. And uh, so we are right now in the process of uh, redoing the website. AJ Karuna has um, uh, picked up the uh, the challenge coin. Related to that, and he's uh, he's putting it together. I've seen a sneak peek of it, so it's uh, it's it's going to be uh, very good, very very good. That's what I'd like to see the the industry do. I would also like to see the industry stop fighting amongst ourselves. Mm. Right? We need to be a collective voice. We can really, if we if we focus our energy on change, and that's what so. Um, the SGAO has a sister company. It's called the SGAO Lobbying Inc. And that is going to be driven to the gover at the government level. So we've got we've got some uptick in relation to pr provincial governments. We have been told by the federal government, um, thanks, but no thanks. Um, why? I have no idea. Um, but there's 133,000 members that I think are going to change their minds. How As, many members are right now? Do you know for this? So for the SGAO, I want to keep those numbers. So it's uh, it's more than a thousand. Okay. Right. Yes. On my on my side of it, and I still haven't vetted all of them. I've got. It's a hard process because yes. you also have people that are offshore that are wanting to get into these no, associations. No, I know. And you're going to get trolls and all right, that kind of right. stuff. Okay, so the reason why I'm saying this is good is because I was looking back as an observer of uh, of the SGAO. I was looking back. It was, it was just paying attention, right? And, and and to me, what I can say is that for what you guys are trying to do for and, and, and what you stand for, um, I just think it's a matter of more people just knowing what it is. And I think stuff like what we're doing today, yeah, I agree. providing that awareness will do so. Because now I have a, a, a complete understanding of what the stand, and, and to me, why wouldn't you stand for this? That would be my question. If you are an agency, why would you not stand for the protection of your people? And your people are protecting human life and asset. That's the truth. And I think a lot of times people really forget, like when they say the word security, that the word security guard, in my opinion, has been so cheapened because of, what it means. And people don't even want to associate 
what they do for a living to say I'm a security guard because of what the connotation behind it. Stigma, so, perhaps. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, yeah 100%. A stigma. So that needs to change. And to me, the reason why I'm thinking this is so powerful is because if there is a standard that we're pushing, then it's very clear to kind of putting a, 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 you know, drawing a line in the sand and saying, if you stand for high level training, if you stand for protecting your people, if you stand for making change in the industry, this is where you stand. If you don't, well, we clearly know where you stand. Right. That's that, it, you're, you're yeah. Either on the bus, you're, or you're, you're off. on the mo- exactly, and it becomes very easy to determine. Okay, you are clearly doing it just for the money. Yes, you know what I mean. And and look, every company is in business to be profitable, but at what expense? And if the expense is your people, which is your product, because they're doing the work out there, you got to reevaluate that. I, I agree. I I one hundred percent agree. Yeah, I so, said do I. So so I, I'm really happy that we had a chance to discuss this. What I do want to just, be, as we close, and by the way, uh, there's so much to unpack here, right? We could be here probably in a day and release eight segments and do it in eight part series. But is there anything else that you guys to close would like to share um, on? Uh, and again, we are anticipating right now that everyone is listening. The decision makers are listening here. Um, anything at all that you would like to kind of share right now that the hopes is that please take this and let's try to move for change. Anything you want to say as closing words? I'll start. I think I'd like you to be the voice to close, but I would like you to, the viewers here, I would like them to review the validity and the necessity for training. Would you, let's just cut to the chase. Do you agree that training is something that should be administered to your staff? Does training in itself create a different platform of safety and a consciousness, a, a different paradigm, if you will? And if not, be prepared to articulate as to why not, why you think that perhaps your resources should not be given reasonable training mechanisms. And what I'm addressing is those trainings should be probably in the power of de-escalation, being able to calm people down verbally, uh, physical self-defense skills, and issues of restraint management. If your job requires you to engage members of the public, to deny access, to ask a person to leave, to create some level of safety. In other words, you may have to come to the aid of another or staff or your fellow colleagues. That's the basis of the training I'm speaking about. Um, I would like you to add your voice to that to say that makes sense. And if not, could you explain to me why? Am I so far immersed into this culture of training, training, training that am I, is there something I'm not seeing? So if you're an advocate of it, sure, support it, pick up that voice. I think there's a lot of governmental agencies need to have you a, a part of that team. And if not, then please take a moment you know, instead of dismissed, explain to us, explain to me perhaps as to why the training is rhetoric makes no difference and it's something I'm not prepared to consider. Mr. Carson. Perfect. I'd add to that. And I, what what I would say is um, from a de-escalation perspective and knowing what you don't know, how to get yourself out of things. um, Because we sometimes think about use of force as uh, our application of force to people. It could also be the... Um, the turning around and running away, right? Yes. So um, three words: run, forest, run. Yes, mm. <laughs> you're absolutely right. I think um, what I would say to everybody who's listening is that um, we need to come together as an industry. Um, I don't think we've ever done that. I think that uh, security guards need to f- need to stop feeling like they're just a number, and that there are people out there that care. I mean, I care. I know that you care about your staff. I know that you care about the people that you train. Um, So I want that to be um, impactful on them, that we care. And if they're they're having problems, we'll try to solution those problems. As far as the the governmental or the legislative uh, entities, um, you know, I know that um, we have good people in the ministry and we know that they're trying to do what they can do. They're being hampered. We don't know why. Um, and, um, you know, it's a it's a fairly easy fix. It just needs to get pushed over the goal line. And, um, you know, maybe we get come out with a stronger industry. I mean, I, I look back to the police associations when there were no police associations. Yes. Yes. And, you know, police would um, would protest in in different ways. Yes. And then you would have then you had the Craig Bromals of the world. And, yes, you know, they came out and said, no, 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 no. Craig. Yes. yes. No, 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 no. This is not the way it's going to go. Different advocates. Right. Mm-hmm. 
Um, and we need to get, I don't, I don't think we need to get to that level, but we certainly need to become more political, um, political facing. And we need to. Similar to Ona. Yeah. Children Nurses Association. Yes. Mm. Yeah. And, and to speak to that, Ona has 92,000 members. Right. We have 133,000 in the province. Right. Mm-hmm. The police have 26,000 in the province. But who's caught the focus and the heartbeat and the level of attention required to protect that entity? Correct. Well, <laughs> that's, a big, that's a big question. Yes, sir. That's okay. a big question. Okay. Next podcast? Yeah, hundred percent. How do people uh, if people want to be part of this uh, association, yeah. please tell us how do we get there? Yeah, so you can go on you can go into LinkedIn. You can um there's a group, uh, Security Guard Association of Ontario. You can um you can uh join that group. Um I have to vet those uh vet those people, so please understand it takes some time for me to do that because we have all manner of uh, people trying to join and uh, very shortly, you'll be able to, well, we'll redirect you to a website uh, for the SGAO as well once that comes live. And then uh, away to the races we go. Okay. All okay. right. Amazing. I w- first of all, I want to thank you both for not only coming on the show, but, you know, you guys are not getting paid for this, as we talked about. Nobody no. is. And you're doing this out of your time and you're doing this out of passion to see change. Thank you for doing that. Thank you for actually being the voice to represent something that is so desperately needed. And the hopes is that we will see change. And uh, obviously, it will be a timely process. But I do have hopes. I'm very optimistic that this is going to happen. And, uh, you know, so am I. and, 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 and uh, you know, I'm actually kind of like, I'm going to say excited that the, the, the fact that conversation is happening yes. and movement and, and, and stuff like this is created. So thank you, gentlemen, for your time. Thank you for having and, us. And uh, you, you guys heard it here. Um, you know, you want to be part of that movement. You'd like to see part of that change. Uh, this is a starting point. Um, have a fantastic day, everyone. And again, thank you, gentlemen, for your time. Cheers. Thanks, Constantine. Thank okay, you. guys. And Steve, the classic keyword to end the, end the podcast. Stay safe. Stay, Stay safe. safe. There you go, guys. Have a good one. Take care. Cheers. Thank you for joining me in today's podcast. This podcast was created for protectors in the fields of law enforcement, executive protection, security, and anyone looking to level up their mindset. If you are learning from this podcast and you're enjoying it, please subscribe to our YouTube channel at The Sentinel Mindset. That's a zero cost way to support us. In addition, please subscribe to the podcast both on Spotify and Apple. And on both Spotify and Apple, you can leave us up to a five-star review. If you have questions for me or comments about the podcast, or guests you would like me to consider on the Sentinel Mindset, please post all comments on YouTube. I do read all the comments. Please also check out our sponsors, thearenatoronto.com. The Arena was created to help all those in the fields of law enforcement, security, and all that achieve their fitness goals. I want to thank our producer, Matthew Doyle, and creative supports, Jasleen Singh, who helped me with this podcast every week. We value your feedback and are here to support you. Tune into the Sentinel Mindset every week where we look in the mirror to make real changes and explore what it takes to achieve greatness in your craft. This podcast is brought to you by Executive Protection Lifestyle Canada. Make sure to drop by next week and don't forget to subscribe.